I'm Robert Cohen, and this is Rocky Mountain Writers, presented by Penn, the only International Writers Association. And with me today is Ricky de Cornet, longtime Penn member, the author of many books, and the one we're going to be talking about today is called Phosphor in Dreamland. Ricky, I want to read a couple of quotes of reviews about your book. This is by Henry Matthews. A delicious, spellbinding masterpiece. That's quite a nice quote. Uh, there's another one in here by a man named Robert Harbison. Like all her work, it is astonishing. A breathtaking succession of marvels. Its fertility and wit are staggering. And as a last quote, this is about a book of yours called The Stain, which we'll discuss but not review today. A tale of witchcraft, prostitution, and sex. A powerful nightmare vision. That's from the London Times. Uh, how do you feel about, I mean, the responses to your books, though? We'll talk about your books, but this seems to be a, a very unusual uh, mountain of accolades, you might say. I think it is. I feel very fortunate, especially because they're strange books. And um, when I, I wrote The Stain, which is my first novel, I was somewhat terrified by it myself. I mean, I wondered about it. I wondered who, who would like it where it would be going, you know, what kinds of friends it would find out there, if any at all. I thought maybe it would sink like a brick in the sea. So, um, no, I've been fortunate because I've reached some sensitive readers who are intrigued by the work. And Well, this, this is, the, I've, I've, I spent last I night, a good part of last night, reading Phosphor in Greenland, mm -hmm. which I found to be a, uh, as Matthew says, a delicious spellbinding masterpiece. I'm delighted. Um, and I thought to myself, well, the person who wrote this uh, is a person of a very, very great erudition, that has an extensive background in the classics, and, and yet at the same time, this is very contemporary. This is a book which uh, some people might find offensive, other people might be obsessed or fascinated with it. Uh, if you were a Muslim, I'm sure that the Ayatollahs would uh, issue an edict for your immediate assassination. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not. It's, uh, but the, interest, the thing that interests me the most is, where does this author come from? I mean, what is your background? Well, can you tell us something about yourself? It's a, it's a somewhat complex background because I grew up in the Hudson Valley. My father was a college professor, so I grew up on a college campus, which was extraordinary. It was a tiny campus at the time. Bard, I think. Um, the Bard College? Bard College. I think the, the student body was under 200 at the time. That's a college. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, there was a wonderful library and a great biology lab full of strange things and bottles and interesting students and music always on the lawn. and. We went to Egypt because my father received a Fulbright there. And um, How old were you then? I was 11. And um, as all 11-year-olds interested in Egyptology and thought maybe that's what I'd do when I <laughs> grew up. And then later went to Chile. My father was born in Cuba, so we visited Cuba quite often. And then later on I married a Frenchman, went to live in Algeria just after the War for Independence, which was my time of political awakening. What, what year was that? 64, so I was there from 64 to 66. Became very interested in uh, fanaticisms of all kind, kinds, political as well as religious, and the connections between the two. Problems of power, problem of evil, something that's haunted me for a long time. So why is that? Oh, because um, I suppose our lives depend on on puzzling that particular riddle, you know. Uh, why do people need to have control over the lives of others? Why this fear of the other, this fear of difference, the fear of change? Why this fear of our own bodies? Why this inability to accept our death? <laughs> what are the connections between those things? So those are themes that I find myself exploring again and again in the in the novels, and I think they really do come out of those life experiences. And then I lived in France for many years. I lived in France for over 20 years. What period was that? Moved there in, uh, when was it? Around 69, 70. So let me get this. We're starting in a small town, <laughs> in a 200 person college town. I mean, 200 people. Not even college. a town. I mean, this was a campus. There was no town. Annandale and Hudson, Barrytown, New York. I mean, tiny hamlets, really. Upstate, upstate uh -huh. New York. From there to Egypt mm -hmm. at the age of 11, from there to Chile, mm -hmm. from Chile to Algeria. 
<laughs> great, about, great about leaps Jury there. France, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and then back and to... And Canada also. I lived in Canada for many years. And, so. and how long uh, have you been in Colorado? Let's see. I think this is the eighth year, eighth or ninth year. Is I this had... part of a, part of a uh, <laughs> migratory <laughs> route? Or do you it's think accidental, space? really. I was, while I was in France, uh, I was eager to come back to the States for a while. And I applied to the Bunting Institute, which at Radcliffe, they give grants to women uh, writers as well as doctors, historians, philosophers, an interesting group, something like 40 women a year. And I received a fellowship there. And while I was there, Denver University needed a writer. And they called me. I, they called the Bunting. The Bunting suggested they call me and had a phone interview and came to Denver as a visitor for a year, as a visiting writer, and um, stayed on, was invited to stay on. I think, uh, so here I am. How many books had eight you years written? Later. How many books had you written prior to that, prior to coming to Denver? I've written a number of books of poetry, maybe six, seven books of poetry, uh, illustrated a number of books. Had, I'd, I think I had finished my third novel when I came to Denver. Well, it's, uh, I can only say that it shows great uh, uh, sensitivity, insight, and courage on the part of the <laughs> people at Denver University to have hired you. I thought you. so, yeah. <laughs> because um, uh, your works are not the plebeian, they're not commonplace, they're very, very esoteric works. Uh, I find them quite fascinating myself, but I think that the reader's level of understanding of things and their historical background uh, is certainly quite a bit above the usual book that is written. I mean, it, uh, I think you have a reader. Uh, if, if someone reads Phosphor in Dreamland and understands it, uh, I think it's a demonstration of a very good educational uh, literary background on their part and ability to to understand things. Uh, it's, it's, it's not at all been all. I guess what I hope for, even though uh, the books are complex in many ways, that the stories are very strong. So that on, on one level, I mean, obviously, you have to be a reader of books to read my books. You can't just sort of leap in blind. But that on one level, there's a, a story that's really engaging and characters with voices that are compelling so that, um, that one might read even quite swiftly with delight, hopefully, and then and then perhaps go back sometime because one would realize there are, there are other levels, there are many things going on, there are many possible readings. You know. yeah, it's certainly it's certainly a, a, on multiple levels, and, and I recommend it for someone who wants serious reading. This is not light reading, this is serious reading, as far as I'm concerned. The story, of course, mm -hmm. is not that complex, but the ideas that you play with and the, uh, you use the characters in the book as uh, vehicles for your own observations, but mm -hmm. I, th I thought in a, in a very uh, well done manner. Uh, let's speak about Phosphor and Dreamland. This is okay. your most recent novel. Yes. And it is published by whom? The Dalkey Archive, which is a wonderful press. The University of Illinois houses the Dalkey Archive. And so if someone wanted to get the book, they would look for Phosphor and Dreamland by Ricky DuCarnay, Dalkey Archive, as the, mm -hmm. as the press. But I understand that Holt is going to come out with some of the Book words. of short stories in the fall. Yeah. A book called The, the Word Desire, a book of uh, 12 stories. And actually, I don't know, I thought of that book of short stories as a kind of uh, Thousand and One Nights because it travels all over the world. And there's a story about Algeria. My first story about Algeria, written so many years later, for some reason it surfaced. And um, a couple of stories about Egypt, a number of stories about France, there's a story about India, a great sprawl, geographical <laughs> sprawl there. Uh, well, and they're I, all about desire. They're all about desire, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and in, in Phosphor and Dreamland, the characters which you've invented, the, uh, the, the nation, the island, Birdland, mm -hmm. which you uh, invented, to me as a reader, uh, and I'm, I don't consider myself to be on your esoteric level, uh, although I've tried, I'm, I'm much uh, more of a, I was a science math major <laughs> for a good part of my education, uh, but I, I find that they're very evocative of some of the stuff that I have read, uh, Voltaire's Candide mm -hmm. uh, is a case in point. Uh, You've uh, been likened, uh, one of your reviewers, uh, I believe, said something about uh, Lenny Bruce. There's a certain <laughs> iconoclastic Lenny Bruce aspect to, to this book, uh, uh, one of uh, looking upon the uh, idols and icons of even contemporary uh, religions as being uh, in a historical context. And, 
uh, not, not being things in and of themselves, but in fact being part of the continuum of development. And could you talk about this particular invention of yours, this, the island of Birdland, the characters of uh, uh, Fagenius, uh, Phosphor, uh, Extravaganza, and so on? Where, where did these ideas come from? It's always a mystery, really, where things come from. I always begin a book blind, in a way. There's a, I have an intuitive sense of a landscape, but there's no map for that landscape yet. But this particular book, uh, originally, I wanted to write about my grandmother. My grandmother was Cuban. I wanted to write about my grandmother's Havana. My grandmother was a very Marquesian creature, um, fascinating, wonderful, and terrifying. Tell, tell me something about it. Your grandmother was uh, born, lived in Havana at the time of the Spanish rule or after independence, after 1898? Yeah, because she, because she was in Paris, um, as it, well before, let's see, she was educated in Paris at the turn of the century, so then she went back um, around that time, 1890s, and came from an, an intolerably um, pretentious background. Her name was Emelina Carmen Dionisia de, la, de los Cerillos de Gavillan, I think that's her full name. <laughs> the thing that um, I remember all the names. She was a great storyteller, and she was a fabricator of stories as well, and quite a character herself. I remember there was a period when she was becoming very, growing very old and, and um, took all the mirrors down so that she could no longer see her own face. And, so she lived in a mirrorless, um, mirrorless home. Mirrorless home, yeah. And you knew her? Oh, very well. And I adored her when I was growing up. I was also kind of terrified by her because she was such an egomaniac. But she told great stories. And I often wondered about these stories, how many of them were fabrications and, and um, how many of them were true. But I thought it would be interesting to, to write a book from her point of view. But then that didn't happen, and the book suddenly took off in this new direction, and I found myself involved in an, an imaginary island in the Caribbean in the what, 17th century. But and this, in, in, a, in a sense, was a Cuba-based concept. Yeah, originally. Yeah. Cuba, and some the, memories uh, of my own of Cuba, too. Yeah. But also I noticed that, that even though you refer to um, Europe uh, as the, uh, the people who have come and conquered the island and eliminated right. the indigenous inhabitants, including the uh, the birds, the look looks. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the situation, of course, in Cuba was that of a captain general from Spain who was the absolute ruler of the island. And you might say that the situation since 1959 has been Fidel Castro as the new mm -hmm. captain general, mm -hmm. but not representing Spain. Uh, a very fascinating uh, place. I've been to Cuba on more than one occasion. And uh, I noticed the old architecture, and, but I was unable really to, during my visit, sort of get into the concepts. And that's, in fact, what you were into through your grandmother. You had the opportunity to be communicated, to have communicated to you the, the attitudes towards life, the, the mixture of uh, religion, mm -hmm. and yet the native life and the, the flora and fauna of an island. And so you create that in Birdland. Oh, well, something else has interested me recently very much. Part of that is, is a growing interest in Mexico, but the, the problem of um, the colonial world. Uh, and obviously, too, that comes from having lived in Egypt as a child and in Algeria later on, and having seen what happens to a country af after a colonial war. But I, I wanted to have, as it turned out, an imaginary place in which the Inquisition had played a role, in which the conquistador had come in and, and destroyed the indigenous population. What happens in, in the book is that the indigenous population keeps on resurging in, in all sorts of ways. Um, so I'm talking about the Inquisition on one hand in the past, but in the present time there's this group called the Queen Sweepers who are horrified by these eroticized objects that appear again and again through diggings and um, also stories and, and recipes that, that research constantly from the past. So that ultimately what happens in the book is that these things begin to percolate up through the surface of the present time and so so that in a way the indigenous population returns or resurges. It's, it, the culture. It's culture resurges. Yeah. And, and so their people are eating um, these wonderful dishes and um, discovering erotic sculpture and, and um, poems are being written and music is being heard and music is being heard in the streets and so on. 
so that there's a kind of haunting that's taking place and a transformation of the of the present day. I noticed uh, as someone who had lived for more than half a century in Los Angeles, on my first trip to Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, How many, many Mexican years Los Angeles is. Yeah, well, not only that, but when I crossed the border and began to drive down through Mexico and I saw all of these hills with churches on top of them, and I realized that these were pyramids that had been covered over with right. earth and That's then a right. church built on top. And then we went to uh, places uh, in the Yucatan, for example, and uh, uh, found that there were like uh, Toltec pyramids on top of Olmec pyramids, on top mm -hmm. of God knows what, mm -hmm. that each successive cultural wave had tried to eliminate its predecessor mm -hmm. and build on top of it, and yet was affected by it in a way. And I think this is something that comes through in your book very much, the, the piling on of cultures and yet the seepage up through. You cannot, unless you kill everyone who practiced that culture and eliminated all the artifacts, it tends to creep back in one way or another. In the United States, we have extensive barrows in uh, Oklahoma that are just being explored in the last few years. There's always this theory that only culture, the, the only real culture that existed was Greco-Roman. And I think that something that your book brings out is the indigenous culture of the Americas. Mm -hmm. uh, that even with the European veneer placed on top of it, it tends to reemerge. Uh, is this a topic that you find of particular personal interest? Very much so. Um, recently, just a number of years ago, went to the region of Chiapas because I'm very interested in what's happening there with the, the Zapatista rebellion and this resurgence of Mayan identity. And um, and then last year went to the Yucatan, and there too saw exactly what you're talking about. Remember one town called Izamal, where the pyramid was was destroyed, not completely, because the base of it I think still exists, but most of it was torn down to build a, a monastery. Of course, these monasteries were really like vast prisons, and people were held captive in there. Um, and as you know, not only were books destroyed, but people were were destroyed as well. And the Inquisition moved into the Yucatan, and the burnings continued as they had been going on in Europe already for for uh, well, centuries. Well, one of the things that impressed me very much in, in Phosphor and Dreamland, and I believe runs through your other books, um, the Stain, for example is the idea of sexuality and, and reproduction, the idea of uh, human reproduction as the life force, as the source of all, and, uh, and yet being more than just a biological function, being in fact a, a form of energy. Right, maybe not reproduction so much as, as exactly as, as erotic energy. You know, that, um, erotic energy is it's not only creative energy, um, and not only a great adventure, eroticism, but um, a way of uh, really being in acute communion with another, intense relationship with another. And it's it's a joint exploration that one makes. It's not um, a lonely one. I've been interested in Tantra as well, and this notion of the transcendence of sexuality. That yeah. um, it's, it's a cre profoundly creative experience. And this is something which I think is in quite the sharp contradiction with the uh, tendencies that you express here, like the clean sweepers and people who are tempting, and uh, Rai Secundo, who is the character right, in the book. Right, the Inquisitor. The Inquisitor who is uh, tormented by uh, visions of sensuality and sexuality uh, that are obscenities. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't go into the detail, I leave that to the readers, but uh, they're really quite moving and I think quite astute uh, observations uh, from a psycholo psychologist's point of view. Well, it's a terrible dilemma. You know, if you're terrified of the body and terrified of death or terrified of reproduction, all these things that speak of the body or speak of the natural world, then it's impossible really to live in the natural world. And there's something tragic about that, but also something comic about that. So I see the Inquisitor also as a, he's a terrifying figure and he's a tragic figure, but he's also a, a comic figure because he cannot control the world. And that, that idea of order and idea of control is, is something which I've explored in, in all my books. In fact, this book, Phosphor and Dreamland, is the fifth novel which follows four that, um, even though they can be read separately, are all investigating this problem of power or this desire to control the universe in some way. And in The Stain, there's a photographer who thinks that he can magically seize upon the world by taking pictures. And that's a theme that comes up again in Phosphor and Dreamland, where Phosphor has invented a camera. And, um, uh, 
this evil character, Fango Fantasma, believes that he can magically hold the island in his own hand if he can only take enough pictures of it. In addition to Phosphor and Dreamland, you've written four other novels. Would you like to discuss them? Well, there's a tetralogy of novels, and each one is based on an element, earth, fire, water, and air. The first one, The Stain, is about a child born at the turn of the century in France with a birthmark on her face in the shape of a gigantic rabbit. Um, and it's furry and purple and covers half her face. And the book is about how people in the village respond to this mark. Um, they see it as a sign either from the devil or from, or from God. And it's a very earthbound book. It's about sin and it's a very Manichaean book. Um, and the second one, Entering Fire, is the fire book and is about the Holocaust in, in France. One of the, the main speakers of the book is a French Nazi, and it deals with uh, the fire of the Holocaust, the fire of sexuality, uh, intellectual curiosity, and also the fire of the burning Amazon, because part of the book takes place in the Amazon. And then The Fountains of Neptune is the water book, and um, about a child who who drowns but does not die and falls into a coma and is in a coma for about 50 years and is about his awakening and reconstructing of a world. So it's a book about dreaming, which seemed fitting for a book about water. And then the final one in the tetralogy is um, it's called The Jade Cabinet, and it's the air book. And there's a character in there named Etheria who is speechless for various reasons and who will vanish at some point. And, um, is as volatile as weather, and there's a lot of wind blowing through that book at various weathers. So Phosphor and Dreamland, which comes after those four books, deals with, with some of the themes of the, of the, the first four, but um, then takes them in new directions. It seems to me that uh, there's a, there, in addition to the Catholicism, which I assume you got from your grandmother, and so on, <laughs> and the Muslimism, which you picked up in Algeria, the Egyptian concepts which you, that you've in fact absorbed the concepts all over the world of, of different uh, human religions and belief systems and, and woven them together into a very fascinating tapestries. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I was brought up, my, mother, my mother's background was, was Jewish and my father's background was Catholic and I was really brought up as an agnostic and when I was about 15, my father came into my room with an enormous pile of books and the Tao Te Ching was one of them. Um, there's a book on Buddhism, brought in Kierkegaard. Um, oh, I don't remember, but sort of a marvelous cornucopia of, of ideas there. And he just said, here, smorgasbord, you know, you choose, what interests you? I became very interested in Taoism, actually, for a long time. Zen Buddhism, that was a, another thing that interested me. Um, so comparative religions have always fascinated me. And, and though I'm still, I mean, and I think never will belong anywhere, um, I'm a searcher and I'm intrigued by the way people deal with the problem of being human. So religion is fascinating. But I'm also enraged by the way religions are used to interfere with liberty of thought and functioning. And so that's why the books are also about that, the problem of bigotry, you know, the, again, the problem of control, the problem of power. If, if you could sum up your philosophy and your works, uh, you know, powerful nightmare vision is uh, one of the descriptions uh, given by a critic. What would you say? What, if you were a oh, critic of so your own difficult. works, how would you describe your own works? I don't know. I've never put myself, I think that it's sort of a terrifying notion to put oneself in the shoes of the critic, as though everything would shut down if I did that. It's hard to do. <laughs> well, let's say but as the I author. Suppose just... They're about fearlessness in some way. You know, the, the courage to live, the courage to perceive the world um, with open eyes, to perceive the other with open eyes, the courage to accept change, that all is flux, that all is movement, um, that difference is absolutely essential to our lives, not only as uh, imagining beings, but um, probably also as genetic beings, you know, that we difference is, is as necessary genetically as it is necessary imaginatively or erotically or creatively. That it's a variable, um, transformative, transforming universe. And, and, um, and you're interested I'm interested in the, 
that you're interested exploring in exploring that. Yeah, interested in process and, and revealing the, ne the necessity of process. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming. We've been interviewing Ricky de Cornet, the author of Phosphor in Greenland, and you can see it here. Thank you. And I think it's a very interesting book, uh, one that seized my imagination. I picked it up <laughs> last night and read it straight through. Oh, that's great. Didn't get too much sleep. I want to thank you very much thank for you. appearing on the show. Thank you. Delightful. <laughs>